Welcome to the first in a series of three artist talks for the Pulp Under Pressure exhibit that is currently on view at the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking. Tonight, we'll hear from Rennie Gower, Melissa Potter, and Maggie Puckett. Rennie and Melissa are the co-curators of this traveling exhibit, and Maggie collaborated with Melissa on several pieces featured in the exhibition. Rennie Gower, has over 40 years of professional experience in the fine arts. Her work has been showcased internationally in Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Australia, Italy, Peru, Korea, Israel, Belgium, England, Moldova, and Moscow. Ms. Gower has received numerous grants and awards, including a 2023 Virginia Commission for the Arts Works on Paper Fellowship. 2020 Pollock Krasner Foundation Grant, a 2017 SECAC Award for Outstanding Artistic Achievement, 2014 College Art Association Distinguished Teaching of Art Award, and the 2014 Virginia Commonwealth University and VCU Arts Awards of Excellence in Teaching, just to name a few. Her work is represented in various collections, including the Library of Congress Print Collection, Pleasant Company, Mattel Incorporated, the American Embassies in Lima, Peru, and Osaka, Japan, Global Center for Drawing in Melbourne, Australia, Capital One, and the Federal Reserve Bank. After 37 years, Professor Emerita Gower retired from the painting and printmaking department at Virginia Commonwealth University in December 2018. In addition to her studio practice, she curates award-winning traveling exhibitions for Wiley Contemporary Incorporated and is available for workshops in paper cutting, encaustic, and professional practices for artists. She holds a Master of Fine Arts degree from Syracuse University, a Master of Arts degree from the University of Minnesota Duluth, and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Ms. Gower currently resides in Virginia. Her work is represented by Chroma uh, Projects in Charlottesville, Virginia. Melissa Hilliard Potter, is a feminist interdisciplinary artist, writer, and curator whose work has been exhibited in numerous venues, including White Columns, Bronx Museum of the Arts, and Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, to name a few. Her films have been screened at international film festivals, such as the Cinefable and the Reeling International LGBT Film Festival. Potter has been the recipient of three Fulbright Scholar grants, as well as funding from CEC ArtsLink, Trust for Mutual Understanding, and Soros Fund for Arts and Culture, all of which enabled her to build two papermaking studios at university art departments in Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Potter has been the recipient of three Fulbright Scholars grants, as well as funding from CEC ArtsLink, Trust for Mutual Understanding and Soros Fund for Arts and Culture, all of which enabled her to build two papermaking studios at university arts departments in Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. In addition, she collaborated with women felt artisans and activists from Georgia through her project Craft Power with Miriam Scher. Melissa developed research documentary and advocacy projects with ethnographers and intangible heritage experts to protect, interpret, and archive endangered women's handicrafts and social customs. In Chicago, this work extends to the history of the whole house arts and crafts movement and its contemporary influence in crafts media, including hand paper making and artist books. As a curator, Potter's exhibitions include social paper, hand paper making in the context of socially engaged art with Jessica Cochran and Revolution at Point Zero, Feminist Social Practice with Nessa Page Lieberman. Her curatorial and recent hand paper making projects include Seeds and Service with Maggie Puckett, 
that have been funded by the Crafts Research Fund, Clinton Hill Foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, and Jane M. Sachs and the Maker Grant. A prolific writer, her critical essays have been printed in Bomb, Art Papers, Flash Art, Metropolis M, Hand Paper Making, and After Image, among others. She holds a MFA from Rutgers University and BFA from VA Commonwealth University. Potter is a professor at Columbia College Chicago and collaborates with artists in the medium of hand paper making. She travels throughout the country teaching, lecturing, and conducting interviews. Melissa lives and works in Chicago, Illinois. Maggie Puckett. Practicing a holistic approach to art making, Maggie Puckett combines the disciplines of papermaker, printmaker, bookbinder, graphic designer, plant midwife, seed saver, and urban gardener. She grows fiber, medicinal, and food plants to sustain her interdisciplinary projects. In 2022, Puckett was an artist in residence at KKV Graphic Studio and Sculpture Workshop Monumental in Malmo, Sweden, where she will produce her ecofeminist seed library, resisting patriarchy and climate collapse through art and ecological biodiversity. Puckett has exhibited widely, including at Expo Chicago, MCA Chicago, Hyde Park Art Center, Johnson Museum of Art, Cornell University, Cambridge Art Association, Paul Robeson at Galleries, Rutgers University, and the Center for Book, Paper, and Print, Columbia College, Chicago. Her work is in the permanent collections of Dartmouth College, Occidental College, Savannah College of Art and Design, Smith College Museum of Art, St. Ambrose University and UC Santa Barbara. Born in Southern California, Maggie Puckett currently lives and works in Chicago. She holds a BS in studio art from New York University and an MFA in interdisciplinary art from Columbia College, Chicago. Her work is represented by Brooklyn Arts Alliance. Thank you all for being here. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so uh, Rennie and Melissa can talk about uh, curating the exhibition. So we'll give you a little bit of the backstory on how this exhibition came together uh, with a particular focus on the art practices of myself, Melissa and Maggie. So in addition to a long teaching and studio practice, I started curating traveling exhibitions about 20 years ago. Hoped Under Pressure um, is my 10th project. Um, Melissa has been invested in the art of handmade paper for over 25 years. And she started at the Dionet Paper Mill in New York and ended up at the Center for Book, Paper and Print at Columbia College, Chicago. But as Jerusha said, her path has also taken her to Bosnia and Serbia as a Fulbright scholar. And she's built numerous studios and taught generations of young artists hand paper making. Rennie and I first met as student and teacher in the painting and printmaking department when I was at Virginia Commonwealth University. And since then, we've been working together very closely. Uh, we have a lot of projects together, including a long-term investment in the College Art Association, where Rennie developed a program called Meta Mentors and Art Happens. Um, and we are also uh, collaborating currently on another show called The Garden. I actually have a slide for that um, in my lecture. In October 2014, I invited Rennie to be an artist in residence at Columbia uh, we, at our Center for Book, Paper, and Print. This was a very luxurious thing I was able to do, was invite artists I love to come and work with my graduate students. And she was um, working on an exhibition there, one of her curatorial projects called Paper Cuts. And this work was done in conjunction with that exhibition. So at that time, I had the pleasure of exploring my work from an entirely new perspective for me. And that was through handmade paper, not my primary medium. And I worked with um, several other artists who subsequently became part of Pulped Under Pressure. 
And Maggie was my superb assistant during my first visit to Columbia College Chicago. I was so um, happy with the results of my residency that I proposed an exhibition of the works to a regional art center in Virginia. But because they also wanted to host a book arts exhibition, I asked if I could curate something special for them. And since Melissa was agreeable to working with me, the pilot project was envisioned and shown at the Visual Arts Center in Norfolk in the spring of 2016. So it took a little time. It took about a year to adapt the exhibition for travel to multiple venues. Everything I understand about traveling exhibitions comes from Rennie. And if you've never done one, it is um, a fascinating science putting it together. Um, so far, it's gone to 16 venues over an eight year period. We it far surpassed our expectations. In the spring of 2017, it launched again at the Monmouth Museum of Art in Lincroft, New Jersey. With traditional hand paper making at its core, pulped under pressure underscores important contemporary issues steeped in history and craft. Enticed through touch, these works encourage a contemplative slowing down, even as they urge acknowledgement of some of the most pressing issues, including environmental crisis and global marginalization facing civilization today. The artists Jillian Bruchera, Julia Goodman, Rennie Gower, Trisha Martin, myself, Marilyn Prop, and Maggie Puckett start simply with a foundation of pulp made from natural fiber. Our multifaceted results incorporate a rich range of printmaking, letterpress, paper cutting, and installation. So in very unique ways, we all consider paper beyond its most common function as a passive surface of record or as purely a craft medium. Instead, the material is transformed and embedded with content that turns the communication into a public practice. And by challenging assumptions, the artists in Pulped Under Pressure create artworks that are both beautiful and brave. Whether directly or metaphorically, there are many themes woven into and between the works in Pulped Under Pressure. Through many different types of interdisciplinary practice, <clears throat> as artists, we all strive to offset environmental destruction and global warming through educational initiatives that promote the preservation of natural habitats and the reclamation of discarded materials. The artists also seek ways to balance a technology media driven consumerist culture with a more contemplative and slower paced, otherwise thought of maybe a spiritual or inclusive interaction with the world. In doing so, we restore cultural histories by recognizing marginalized communities and the universal codes embedded in the individual and in the medium itself. Most importantly, as a group, we expand an autobiographic narrative into a cultural critique, fostering collaboration and community engagement. So um, my artwork recognizes geometric mm -hmm. perfection or what some people know um, as sacred geometry as the matrix of the cosmos. And so since ancient times, the perfect forms of the circle, the square and the triangle have all thought to convey sacred and universal truths by reflecting the fractal interconnections of the body and the natural world. We all recognize these ratios. And one finds these similarities embedded in the decorative designs of all cultures across the globe. So significantly by incorporating these motifs into contemporary works, one can reveal the cross-cultural bonds of our shared humanity. So inspired, I um, produced new geometric iterations based on these traditional patterns and cultural symbols governed by the universality of mathematical perfection. And initially my work was informed by American Peace Quilt. Go back, Melissa. Um, my studio practice has also expanded to include hang, uh, okay. Hand cut paper works and cut vinyl or sand installations for windows, doors, or the floor that are also inspired by Celtic knotwork and Islamic tile patterns. Using unique stencils, the small paper cuts that are seen here are directly related to the pulp paper works and pulped under pressure. For these works, I designed seven inch motifs that are arranged in nine square grid and cut in, into mylar. Okay. Um, through the universal language of sacred geometry, my art celebrates slow work made by hand, while it counters visual skimming and encourages uh, quiet reflection on the part of the viewer. And as such, I think it's a perfect conduit for conversations that can build community despite shifting social political narratives. So enticed through touch, repetition, and beauty, 
My work encourages a physical and a contemplative slowing down. And by embracing the, re the redemptive effect of a highly focused methodical work made by him, my artwork transforms a shared encounter into a meditation that quiets the nonstop noise of our time. At least that's what I hope it does. So I started paper cutting in 2006 when I was teaching a summer studio class in Glasgow, Scotland, and I, I was beginning my research on the Celtic knotwork patterns. My first paper cut was a one-off piece created to meet a need, which was to produce a large complex piece for an exhibition in a limited amount of time. From there, I've continued to create large 85 by 55 inch cut paper works that use 10 inch stencils, also in, um, inspired by the Islamic tile patterns. The stencils are traced and hand cut into interlocking motifs on large sheets of paper that it's painted and lined with silk. Using only a simple snap blade, I employ the slow process of cutting the entire work by hand. The process is contemplative for me and hopefully contemplative for the viewer as well. The intense color painted on the back side of the paper is what you see reflected off the wall and blends with the cast shadows. Okay. A combination of paper cuts and vinyl cuts for windows and floor have evolved into site-specific exhibition called Geometrics, A Perfect Proof. The next couple of slides are different iterations of this project, and the goal for Geometrics is to create an immersive contemplative experience for the viewer. Next slide. This is an installation at um, Penn State University in Altoona, and I had the wonderful opportunity to create this 16 um, window um, vinyl installation for their study center. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, I've also done um, variations on the idea using sifted sand, and this was at the McLean Project for the Arts in 2022. Um, obviously, this is a very temporary temporary um, installation and I had to revisit the gallery several times to repair the work after a young child inadvertently walked through it several times. Next slide. And then the most re recent iteration is, was at Art Space Gallery in Richmond, Virginia. And um, it was a much smaller venue, so it was much more intimate, but um, I just, uh, love the way the light comes through the cutting on the window. And then the last slide, um, I was just delighted with the enthusiastic interactive response of these kids. Um, and it just sort of reaffirmed that the response to my work confirms the prevalent yet profound spiritual and emotional qualities of color, light, and pattern. So I hope to keep revisiting this project at new venues in the future. Okay. So um, I'm introducing and then I'll ask Maggie uh, to join me in a conversation. The Seeds and Service um, Project, which is featured in this exhibition, <clears throat> happened a little bit after uh, a project that I did um, with Jessica Cochran. She was our exhibition curator at the Center for Book, Paper, and Print, um, which was at Columbia College, Chicago. I came there in 2008 to be the only full-time tenure-track hand paper maker in the country. Um, and it was an extraordinary place. Maggie was a student the year that I started there. And uh, this project, Social Paper, the full title of the exhibition was called Social Paper, Hand Paper Making in the Context of Socially Engaged Art, um, <clears throat> was built from many years of thinking and research I had done on the ways that in particular women, but men and women, um, are involved in social engagement through hand paper making. And so when I came to the city of Chicago, there's an incredible social practice movement. There's one, of course, in many different parts of the, the globe, but we specialize in a very particular brand of art education-based um, pedagogical social practice. And so I really started understanding this medium of hand paper making in, in that context. Um, the show featured um, six commissioned essays. Uh, we were able to launch it as an international conversation with people ranging from um, John Rousseau to Kim Berman and her South Africa project, Maggie Puckett, um, who had been a recent graduate. Um, it was, and Julia Goodman, who was who was featured in uh, the this exhibition, Pulped Under Pressure. And so um, a couple years after that, the graduate students actually designed a papermaker's garden. The papermaker's garden, I always like to give a shout out to Helen Hebert, 
who was the person who put that concept in my head. I managed her paper makers gardens at PS um, 141 and um, some of the other public schools in the uh, New York City area. And um, the students proposed that they build a paper maker's garden to grow our own fiber for the paper program at the Center for Book, Paper and Print. The school not only did it, and it's very classic Columbia, they did it with great conviction and power and they built it on an entire city block. So as the person who was charged with kind of overseeing this, I realized that we were kind of in deep doo-doo because 10 beds that I, Maggie can probably say exactly what the sizes are, but they're, they were at least 30 to 40 feet long and six feet wide. And I just knew that this was gonna be a huge undertaking. So. Maggie and I took a drive one day and I asked her to think what should you know could we try to cook up a project in five of these beds so that we would have something going on and that is how uh, the seeds and service program was born. Maggie do you want to add anything to that story that backstory? Um, no, you're doing great. I just, I remember that drive we took. <laughs> I know, we actually were going to see Laura Miller's show. And yeah, yeah so we we, we uh, dreamed up the Seeds in Service title, which is Seeds in Service, playing on the term in service, which is education. The picture you see here um, is from the incredible Chicagoland legacy of John Dewey's thinking, thinking through making, which was actually a concept that we embraced at the Center for Book, Paper, and Print. And so the pieces that we have featured in the show are a collection of works that we did. I think one of the things, and again, I'll ask Maggie to sort of weigh in. One of the things that was so amazing about this project is that it did two things at once. It supported each of us individually in our own interests and research, and it supported each other collaboratively to do work that would have been completely impossible as individuals. So in these images that you're seeing here, and I'm gonna talk about them a little bit when I talk about my own work, um, in the bottom represents uh, a lot of the research I've been doing. The top represents a lot of research Maggie had been doing on pre-colonial corn. Um, she created a relationship with the Zapatista community. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about that, Maggie? Oh, sure. I was able to uh, acquire some seeds from uh, the revolutionary group, the Zapatistas in Southern Mexico. Um, and we were able to grow this, this corn in our paper mirrors garden. The soil was rich and lovely, and we got nice 12 foot tall stalks of corn, huge. Um, unfortunately, though, we weren't able to save the seeds from those because of where we live, of course, is not quite the right climate uh, in Southern Mexico. So we weren't able to save the seeds from those, um, but it was a great way to kind of connect with the, that community um, and learn more about their culture and their history and their activism. Awesome. And then over time, you see these sort of uh, pieces that are like in the four, three by five to four by six range. Those are actually seed packets. And Maggie and I started designing seed packets that are, um, are thematically about the different things that we were doing. I'm gonna show a close up of one of them in a moment. But on the bottom, this work reflects a lot of research I had done by the Hull House, Jane Adams Hull House wage workers who had actually been going door to door in the South Loop community, which is where um, where we are in uh, Columbia College is in South Loop, the white boxes are actually brothels. And so what they discovered in all of this work talking to new newly um, immigrated uh, people to the city of Chicago is that a very large percentage of the buildings that were in our area where the papermaker's garden was actually um, developed were brothels. And so I worked um, with Maggie and I was doing a lot of research on uh, women who were working unknown whether by force or by choice um, in that area. Um, and so we produced a lot of research. We did a program called um, uh, Food, Sex and Death. This is an image from the table clause that um, I will show a close up of that, but this is these are actually from the Jane Adams Hall House wage maps. These are the streets that intersect with the with the um, uh, the papermaker's garden in the South Loop, and the white boxes are actually the brothels that um, that they charted there. These pieces of paper they're deceptively small looking. They're four by eight, eight feet, perfect size for a banquet, which is what Maggie and I did um, in that space to talk about 
the intersection of this incredible history that we found by women who are trying to do reform around women in the vote and about giving women more choices as new immigrants to the Americas um, and women who are doing contemporary labor uh, in agriculture. So this is an image from the food, sex and death um, uh, performance that we've had. We invited a group of curators and artists and activists to come and have a uh, curated dinner with us. The menu card is printed on um, uh, potato paper, which was done as a remediation project with the University of Wisconsin. Um, and through this project, we told the story of women working in contemporary agricultural labor, which is, an, is um, unfortunately a realm of great exploitation and, and lack of autonomy. And we wanted to really um, animate those stories and voices. Um, so this is a close up of one of the uh, one of the seed packets. We we also named some of our seeds that we would collect. Um, this was originally from the Velvet Queen sunflower, which came. Maggie might be able to correct me. I believe either from UIC University of Illinois at Chicago or from the Jane Adams Hall House Library. Um, yeah, I, I renamed think, I think it. We got it from the library. Yeah. From from Jane Adams. I think so. I think we may have too. That was and our so, first year. Yeah. Yeah. So this tells the story of those women because I was really invested in trying to tell the stories of those women and and even find some of the names of the women um, who had been working there. And I renamed this particular seed the Lizzie Shackley. Um, sunflower, which was one of the women I was able to discover um, in this research. This is made out of sunflower paper, but Maggie made one that was made out of corn. Um, she also made one out of lettuce uh, stalk that had bolted. So a lot of our work too was about um, looking at the ways that agricultural waste could be repurposed for our papermaking projects as well. So <clears throat> I'll spend just a couple of minutes talking about my own work, and then I'll hand over uh, the PowerPoint to, well, Maggie has her own PowerPoint to show her work that she has in the exhibition, talk about her work. Um, what you see here is a series of work I did called Craft Power, Tushetti Rub. Tushetti is a region in the Republic of Georgia, as mentioned by Jerusha and my bio. I've spent a lot of time in the former Soviet states um, exploring the traditional cultures of women. I've continued that work. I got fascinated with the um, rub tradition, which is in that uh, region in Tushetti, Republic of Georgia. There are hardly any of those women left doing that work. In fact, there may be none left. Uh, they're made out of felt and the symbol systems that you see are actually Zoroastrian um, images that appear. So if you looked at these, you might actually think they could be Navajo or they could be South American, but they're actually Republic of Georgia. And so I worked with an incredible ethnographer named um, Robert Chensenier, who taught me a lot about these international symbols of fertility, um, continuance and uh, sovereignty and resilience. Um, and so these were also done in a project with Paul Cadenese, my colleague at Columbia. We were experimenting with new media processes in handmade paper. And so these actually, the lighting in them um, is L-wire embeds, which were, um, we were experimenting with things that we could actually embed in the paper. The paper is flax. It remains one of my favorites. Um, I've tried to grow it. It's, it's incredibly difficult to grow for any of my um, hand paper makers in the audience. Canadians, there's some really successful Canadians who grow it. Um, it doesn't grow quite as well in this region, although it can, but it's incredibly painstaking to um, collect. And so the material that I get and we work with at the center it ranges from uh, Belgium to, you know, different parts of, of Europe. So you'll also notice they both look a little bit different. They were done from separate um, batches every time. It's a little bit different. And this is one of the things that's so fascinating about papers that it is actually a, um, a sort of a barometer of what's taking place in the environment. The soils and all of the materials in them are what, um, what make them look the way they do. Uh, this is just an image from Columbia when I was working with Paul, showing the ways that we do two sheets of paper, embedding certain kinds of things in it, using two pieces of paper to laminate it, 
And then we run them through a very heavy press in order to press them into one sheet of paper. Um, this project uh, has stayed with me and has never gone away. So I never got over that fascination with the um, with what I witnessed and saw in Republic of Georgia and never quite got over the idea of rugs being sort of an international lingua franca um, among many different artisans, but in women in particular, I was interested in these more obscure versions. I started uh, working with a weaver um, and she taught me how, her name is Monica Neuland Thomas, I am her worshiper. Um, she runs a program called Social Fiber and she taught me and my class of paper makers how to hand spin paper yarn. And so I started working on a tapestry loom and I started recycling. I got to a point where I had all this paper, this is very typical for hand paper makers. The paper usually is so beautiful, you can have it languish in um, portfolios for years on end thinking, I'm gonna get a great project for that. And I just decided to stop, cease and desist and use all of the material in my mitts. These are from uh, papers that I made from uh, an old quilt that my mother made. Some that pinkish is uh, okra fiber from material that we grew in the paper maker's garden. And you'll also notice a subtle um, L wire embed. And I just kept going with this work. <clears throat> These works represent, they're also featured in the garden, Rennie and Rennie's new project. Um, that's another traveling exhibition. Uh, but these reflect um, all those papers that have been sitting around for, for a long time. And I call them a material autobiography because they really are reflections of the places that I have been. The one on the left called Mokosha's Rug, all inspired by uh, Mokosh, who is the goddess of Yugoslavian weaving. Um, and all of the papers that are in there are hand spun and cut from different time periods. Some of them are from the Haystack Mountain School of Crafts, where I got obsessed with lichen. Some of them are from switchgrass, from the Lurie Garden, hand dyes, all these things that I've been doing over time that are about time and space. The one on the right um, is a sumac scrap. I was experimenting with different methodologies and how the paper would behave. No, it does not behave like uh, like wool. It actually hates to be on a tapestry loom. So, you know, like paper making itself, it can be like kind of brutalizing, but the effects are pretty interesting. And all of the pieces in the middle are scraps of, of um, spinning that I had been doing. Um, this piece was the first one that I did that went into um, Rennie's show, The Garden. And I call it archive, again, really playing on these ideas of the paper is a piece of paper, and traditionally we think of paper as a recording device for some kind of autobiographical context, but for me it's a record of a place and a time, and so I started playing with this idea of like weaving these scraps of different projects and things that I had done over time into artworks. Um, this piece too, I did a really fun photographic series. My husband is a photographer and, and took the, these photographs of me called Plant Protection, Paper Protection, which were during the height of the pandemic. Um, and I was working a lot in my bedroom on a tapestry loom and trying to soothe myself with all of my material autobiographies of places that I wasn't sure to go for quite a while. Um, and so this project also continues. I've been making a lot more paper and and, you know, um, thinking about the ways that I can intersect hand paper making with different traditional practices. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Maggie. Did you have anything else you wanted to add about um, seeds and service, Maggie? Oh, I'm definitely touching on it in my in my work. You yeah, go, so girl. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. So I'm share. done. You go ahead and share. <laughs> okay. Um... I don't have a PowerPoint. I've got a PDF because I like to design an InDesign, but I need to figure out a way to make that more user friendly when sharing, um, get a full screen. So apologize, you don't get the full full screen effect here, but you'll be able to see enough. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm Maggie Puckett, co-founder of Seeds and Service. Um, I love to show this slide. It just shows the multifaceted project that Seeds and Service is and all the different things that we did together. Um, over many years, many different gardens, even different multiple gardens per year. Um, Mel and I were fortunate enough to go to Seed Savers Exchange in Iowa um, a few years ago and take their seed saving school. So we actually learned the proper techniques for saving seeds and um, when they're mature enough and how to keep them from getting um, genetically uh, poorer as they go. Some, some seeds um, need to have a big diverse gene bank like corn. So we realized right away that corn was a hard one 
to grow in our small, you know, even though it was a large uh, paper maker's garden for us, it, in terms of corn, that was a hard one to be able to save seeds from um, in an effective manner. Um, but we do pedagogical gardens, and so we learn a lot and we teach a lot from them. Um, so here you'll see some our graphics from seed saving, um, and we saved a lot of plant material for teas as well, herbal teas. Um, you see some images here of cooking our corn stalk fibers um, that we used in the the lettuce, um, or sorry, the the lettuce stock fibers that we used in the lettuce seed packet. And what I really want to share with you is the amazing um, trip that we got to take to Svalbard in 2019. I got to take our project up to um, a deep cavern carved inside a frozen mountain on an island high in the Arctic. So the archipelago of Svalbard here, which is the Arctic Circle, we're looking down on the earth from, um, from the Arctic. And the Global Seed Vault is there. And it holds over a million seed varieties from around the world. Um, this year is its 15 year anniversary. But what is missing from all these seeds are stories that gave them life, all the cultural histories and ecological relations. Um, so, so much about our work has been about th those relations. And then this project um, carried by Fern Wixen brought artists together from around the world to the island of Svalbard where the seed bank is. And so here are the artists. Um, we've lined up with our boxes that are full of artwork and it's to mimic the boxes. It's the same type of boxes that the seeds are saved in in, this, in the seed vault. Um, so we did not actually get to place our artwork in the actual current seed vault because they don't really allow artworks in there. It's, it's a very important and safe place for seeds. However, the original vault is just up the hill from that, um, the inspiration for the, the current vault. In 1986, they opened up the seed vault in an old coal mine with an interesting connection to climate change being one of the reasons why we're saving the seeds. So here's the artists led by Fern Wixen, um, deep inside this old coal mine. It was cold and glistening, it was very cool. <laughs> um, and so here's the door to the seed room. And so this, um, is in Norwegian, Freud Hall means seed room. Um, and so I've used this graphic in some artwork that we'll see, it's been very inspirational to me, um, this emblem that's on the door. And here in the middle is the original seed vault where they still have the seeds in there from 1986 and they've done tests on them um, at each decade to see their viability. And we've done two, there's uh, two artwork deposits um, that have been done in the seed vault, including ours. And so here's a graphic of the work uh, Mel and I were able to in turn into the seed vault um, where it will be kept um, who knows how long to be discovered by future archaeologists, perhaps. <laughs> um, here we have, uh, we, we did our seeds and service newsletter. So it was a snapshot of the projects we had worked on up until that time. Um, and I'll show more details of these. Uh, the Illuminated Feminist Seed Bank, which was our um, major catalog uh, that we put together with all of our gardens and events um, and projects and research and activism. Um, a timeline of the year in the life of an eco-feminist art project, which shows in paper um, the art projects that we work on throughout the year, including uh, creating our gardens and having to tend to them and water them, weed them, harvest them, start processing fibers, saving seeds, and then creating artwork and planning again in the winter. We included our seed packets, included Baba Yaga's medicinal tea and uh, an accordion book with seed packets called Feminist Gardens Everywhere. So the seeds and service timeline that I just described, here's some details. Um, it's a long book along the, um, you can see here on the right, I have a picture of the spine um, and each signature is a unique piece of handmade paper that represents um, either from the winter and <laughs> here in Chicago, it feels like it's always winter. So I started in winter, um, the decayed leaves, things are breaking down, turning into soil. Um, and then of course, as uh, spring comes, we start to plant and water and harvest fibers. And as the fibers are harvested and processed, they become more refined. Um, and we continue to plant seeds throughout the year. Um, or this, throughout the summer, 
And then in fall, a big harvest and a big push to make a lot of work. Um, and of course, in winter, we have our planning. And so there's one piece of non-handmade paper at the end, and it's a seed catalog from Seed Savers Exchange, which is one of the best things to get in the winter <laughs> when you're dreaming of warmer days. So here's some close-ups of um, the timeline book. This was a lot of fun to make. We even were able to make paper from mushrooms. Um, we went down and got some pretty fun mushrooms from Chinatown and were able to make reishi paper and I think lion's mane paper was really very interesting. So if you can try mushroom paper someday, I, I suggest you do. Um, Mel touched on these already, uh, but showed again the black Aztec corn and Min's lettuce mix. Um, this corn paper was the dreamiest of corn fibers that I've ever used, and I think it's because we harvested it while it was still a bit green, and I, it gave us um, this really resilient, strong fiber that wouldn't crack when folded, and since then, every time I've made corn paper, and it's been more mature kind of brown corn fibers, um, it's been much more susceptible to cracking, so I suggest trying greener corn fibers for paper making if any of you are doing that. So here's the lettuce paper, some shots of the process of cooking down the stalks. Our lettuce, yeah, we let it bolt and uh, we collected seeds and then um, cooked down the fibers and made seed packets. The accordion book, Feminist Gardens Everywhere, which had um, seeds that we had saved from um, many of our gardens over the years um, and packets on handmade seed paper. And I designed this book to somewhat mimic the shape of the seed vault itself. Um, and here we have Baba Yaga's medicinal tea. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a holistic artist, so it's not just about making um, the art um, per se, it's about, you know, kind of day-to-day -day practice um, and, you know, eating and drinking um, and medicine and joy. Here's our book in a limited feminist seed bank which is available for purchase. <laughs> you can find a link on our website um, it's a help, it, just to help us you know, keep working on our projects. Um, Labor of Love, there's a lot of great information in here um, that we'd love to share with everyone. So most recently, um, I got to go uh, in last year, finally, <laughs> to Sweden to do an artist residency. Um, I had been scheduled to go in 2020, but that didn't work out and for a couple of years it was postponed. So it was really nice to be able to get out there. Um, and it was in conjunction with Women's Studio Workshop, they have an exchange program. And so I was able to go to Sweden in the South of Sweden. Um, and it's just over the water from Copenhagen. So it's pretty easy to get to. And I was able to get into their paper studio or their printmaking studios. And I brought a bunch of my um, handmade paper with me and photopolymer polymer stencils um, of graphics, some that I had drawn um, and some that I had pulled from early modern uh, woodcuts uh, around the European witch hunts. So here's a detail of the witch's pharmacopoeia. This is elf doc, um, which is also known as Ella Campaign. It's a sunflower relative. Um, and here is uh, yes, an accordion seed packet with some of my crazy demons and witches and corn doll witches flying around. And you'll see in all of these is that Froy Hall emblem that we saw on the Svalbard door. Here's a few more from that series. Um, we have uh, Bitter Buttons and Yarrow as well. And my goal is to do another round and get some of these artworks back up into this, uh, the seed vault. <laughs> that would be the ideal. Um, and, and finally here I have the Battle of Froy Hall. This is a, um, a larger piece um, on handmade paper showing um, what I'm calling seed hags defending the seed vault. So kind of showing uh, this, this fight between, um, I think I would say the, the dangers that seeds are facing and the people that are trying to to save the seeds and protect them from climate change and war and corporate um, takeover. Um, and a few more drawings that I'd done on handmade paper here. Um, but it looks like we're getting closer to time. So I think I'll end there because I have too many extra slides. <laughs>
won't be able to uh to get all to, to all of them. Can you click through a few more just so that quickly so that we Oh can... sure, okay. Just wanted to make sure we had time for questions. <laughs> So these are some yeah some drawings that I have done um, putting together plants, animals, and demons uh, together in surrealist form. There we go. Okay. So here's a one of the pieces that is in the exhibition. Um, so based also on um, the Hull House maps, this particular map though was um, uh, the different nationalities that lived in those regions, and I was fascinated by that type of diversity cultural diversity. So I made a book based on that, um, that had cultural and um, plant diversity represented. And uh, again, yeah, Mal, Mal showed you some of this graphic, um, our menu for the Food Success Project and the potato paper, um, oops, and the potato stem paper that we made that from. All right, I think that's it. That's what I got. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, awesome. There's so much good stuff that you guys covered in. And um, thank you for sticking to the time so that we have time to ask you guys some questions. There's one here asking if any paper was made from asparagus or artichoke fiber. Oh, Ooh, I've done artichokes. I ate my weight in artichokes so I could make a big sheet of artichoke paper. That was one of the best things I have ever done. <laughs> um, it works great and it's beautiful and soft velvety. And I, I swear it still smells like artichokes and maybe a little mayonnaise. <laughs> I've never tried asparagus. <laughs> and I put in there, I've been uh, working with milkweed. It's uh, a bast fiber. So you have to collect the plant and um, steam it and strip it, but it's very strong and silky and, and really quite stunning material. Um, some of the fibers, you have to be uh, a crazy person to um, actually make them happen because they have so many steps in the process. Um, I had a question for you all. Uh, why is paper making a primary medium for you? Like why paper? Um, it's not my primary medium. I'm just one of many mediums that I explore. Um, trained as a painter, still think of myself as a painter. I'm, I'm not a printmaker, um, but a lot of the people who work with handmade paper are printmakers. I mean, for me, it's just a very um, wonderful, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to explore what I was thinking about with a different material. So I'm all about material. And in this case, it happened to be pulp. But I'm a little, I'm a, the outlier of the group when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you and yeah I also I wouldn't say I'm predominantly a paper maker um, and it, I didn't even get to experience paper making until I went to Columbia College um, I had started as you know, I was doing bookmaking and printmaking um, and it actually it took a it took a little bit for it to really like sink in for me but then what I realized was my my envir environmental interests and wanting to make a sustainable art practice really connected with the process of uh, making my own materials. Um, and then that led, of course, to gardening. So you had to grow your own materials and that led to seed saving. Of course, you had to save seeds for the next year's materials. So it's been a, a fun slippery slope to go down. I do, I mean, I call myself an interdisciplinary artist, but I do identify most specifically with paper. And I think it's taken me half a lifetime to figure out why I'm so attracted to it. but. I recently did an interview where I said something. I was like, yes, that's it. Because I think a lot of times as artists, you're doing things and you don't quite know why you're doing them, but you're very attracted to them. You can't master paper making. The, the, the line is always moving, whether it's climate or the material itself. It's been sitting around too long. It won't pulp. Your water's screwed up, whatever. So um, I find that really interesting. I find it to be the super fascinating challenge every time you're doing it. Um, I've studied print and and um, painting, and I love both of them too. But uh, papers, like you know, restarting a relationship every time I do it, pretty much. I mean, I just did a whole for a book project I'm working on. I did burdock, which is a bass fiber. Insane. I mean, only an insane person would try to make paper by hand from burdock. And it's the most unbelievable paper I've ever made in my whole life. It's like rattly, um, like, I mean, for those of you who know paper, it's like flax rattly, and it was bright green. 
because I made it in the summer, which was a lot of plants lose their color when you when they go through that process. Um, I also, you know, I mentioned before, I think of it as a material autobiography. So I don't think of it as like a sheet of paper. I actually think of it as something really talismanic that is sort of holding a whole unspoken record of a place. And I'm, I've been endlessly fascinated with that as a concept. I was thinking about paper cutting and I think Jerusa, you said you were also a paper cutter, that you did some paper cutting. I mean, and I'd make very large paper cuts that are like seven by five feet out of a single sheet of paper. And inherently that's insane because you're subtracting and making holes in this piece of paper. So you're sort of violating it at the same time. But if you work with your patterns, you build in the structure as you go. And so there's a fragility, but a strength, there's a mystery. There's a um, sort of um, magic, I think, that happens when, when the color reflects and bounces off the wall. And so in some ways, I think with Mel, there's always a surprise sort of built in um, when you actually finish the piece and turn it over <laughs> and actually see what you made. So yeah, it keeps you engaged. Mm -hmm. um in our chat, someone asked, what is your favorite part of the, or step of the process? I mean, I'll jump in and just say that I, you know, I've been teaching paper now for a long time, uh, for 15 years at Columbia and for, you know, a few years before that point. And um, it attracts a very particular kind of person, in my opinion. It, it attracts sort of a worker, physical I Maggie will crack up a lot of Californians or come through the Center for Book and Paper. Um, but I I just love its physicality. I, you know, find it just so astoundingly amazing to be like surrounded in stink and cooking and, and beating and mashing and all that stuff. I just I love all of those aspects to it. To me, it's, to me, it's like gardening. It feels a lot like gardening, sort of getting your stuff dirty all the time and, and being at work a lot of the time. So. I agree. It also reminds me of uh, cooking. And I, as a kid, I would make potions before I could be in the kitchen cooking and I would do weird, strange things and um, just always wanted to be creative. And so paper making is, is like that too. There's so many uh, variables and so many things that you can um, explore and experiment. So I think I love that aspect of it is um, always finding a new avenue to explore and a new way to connect it to what issues are, you know, interesting me at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much history with making paper and, you know, I was really lucky to go to Columbia College Chicago Weiss. And the first time I was there, Maggie helped me make amazing pieces. And the second time I went, we thought, well, we'll just name the way we did them with Maggie. Well, it didn't work that way again. And so Mel just wandered in and says, well, if it doesn't work this way, use a scoop. You know, <laughs> so it's like we just, you know, you're always kind of inventing something on the fly just to get a product that's, you know, satisfactory in some way. And you don't really know what you got until it's been pressed and dried. And so I never knew really what I had until months later when they mailed it back to me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, this was fun. This was good. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I would love to make more, you know, pulp paintings, but um, I just was looking for other ways to use the stencils that I created to go to the paper studio. And so that took me down another rabbit hole into mono printing and, vector files and vinyl cutting and you know it's so just the, the vinyl cuts are not hand cut or are they vinyl cuts are not hand cut they're cut on a plotter and you know they're quite large and um, well that's something I have I have, I'm still you know learning how to manipulate um those files um I do all the weeding by hand so I feel like it's kind of the same intensity it's just I'm not doing it. Right. Someone asked, how are weaving and paper making connected? Oh, hi, April. Um, well, so, you know, a lot of the handicraft processes, first of all, are plant-based, right? Because they're, they're, they start with plant material, 
not all of them, but a lot of them. And textiles and paper share the same material. So, yeah. you know, throughout throughout history, the idea of like um, of growing something that was spun um, is somewhat similar to the idea of uh, creating that material so that it could make paper. Um, paper yarn. I mean, April, you probably have a lot of fascinating information and experience with this because paper yarn is a thing. I mean, I'm starting from scratch and like on an old um, drop spindle, which is nuts, but you can you spin. Shifu? Exactly. Things like shifu, even in, in the um, Scandinavian countries, there are certain types of uh, raffia spinoffs. Of course, raffia, I believe, is Africa or South Asian. I mean, there are lots of traditions in paper thread. Also in uh, places like the Philippines, there are um, paper thread that are used for clothing. So -hmm. there's a huge interconnection between weaving and and paper. Amate, I think, is another really interesting study in um, parts of the Pacific Islands. There are uh, bark clothing fiber, you know, clothing made from like bark fiber. So there's a really big connection. Now, between is a mate beaten then? A mate is but... beaten and macerated into sheets. So it's not technically considered paper, although as a substrate, of course, it's more it like the it's more like the Polynesian stuff that's exactly, exactly. Bark rather than shredded. Exactly. But, you know, the same, it's the same idea. It's a hydrogen bond that makes them stick together. It's exactly the same thing that makes them actually form into something. And this, a lot of the same processes exist. But they're not broken into individual fibers, like, like, yeah, well, the the fibers, the fibers themselves have a molecular connection and attraction to one another when introduced to water. Um, So, yeah, and also I think of weaving the warp and weft being very much like a hydrogen bond in a sheet of paper. That's how, you know, the the, the fibers themselves have to align in such a way to make a a sheet of paper that has a certain kind of mathematic to it the way weaving does, so. So we only have a couple minutes before uh, the program officially. ends um and there's been goodness there's so many more questions i want to ask you guys uh, <laughs> the work is the work is amazing um may, i might end on um you know you guys put this show together was it in 2016 uh-huh. um are there other artists that um that you feel like are in conversation with the work uh that's in the show with the with the uh, topics that are, are happening in the show. Um, and also, did it how many of you knew one another before before this was put together? Take it away, Rennie. Uh, well, I met uh, most of them through my visits to Columbia College Chicago through Melissa. And so the the I guess the touchstone for everybody is Melissa and the book center for book paper and print um there are a lot of artists that deal with the issues and what i what i'm very proud of is that this show back in 2016 of course we were experiencing all these issues in in the work but they're very current and up front and still you know really poignant and um, of concern today even more so i think in some ways you know that our our um, focus on environmentalism, our focus on, on you know, uh, recycling, on um, marginalized communities, on just trying to find a place disengaged from the noise. I mean, these are all things that are um, part of this project and um, continue to resonate, I think, across across the, the board. So, I mean, in a way I'm surprised the show has, had, has such legs, but in other ways, I think it's probably gonna keep going because it's still very um, much about what people are worried about. Mel, Mel why don't you add to that as the co-curator? <laughs> well, I mean, um, 
I'm always inspired by the people who were my students that become mentors. I mean, we were the only graduate program of its kind. And so it was very quick that people like Maggie learned the material and then were able to work alongside me in the studio. So it was a totally special thing. I mean, it's, I, and yes, they're great undergraduates, but basically with someone like Maggie, I was able to just roll it out and be like, yeah, I can have Rennie in here and actually impress her with this medium. So, you know, that was a very um, exciting way to make connections. Um, but I'm sure Maggie has something to add to, to like, you know, artists who are working that, that were part of our community, right? Oh, it was such a special, special uh, center being there and all the incredible artists and opportunities that we had. I mean, it completely changed, you know, the trajectory of my art, artistic practice um and and continues to as well which is incredible and yeah I mean can, you know kudos to to you Mel and Rennie for putting together such an incredible show that right has been traveling for so many years and continues to resonate and I think mean, only ever more so um and I know it's in the art world it's been hard to get uh craft handcrafts especially um their their due time in the spotlight and so I think that you guys did a tremendous job um, showcasing these arts and showing them to the public. Thank you. That's a wonderful note to, <laughs> to end on. Thank you guys so much. Um, so <laughs> this is just the first of a series of talks. I hope that um, you all will uh, come back and join us for um, the remaining two talks. Um, one in June, Wednesday, June 14th, we'll be hearing from uh, Julia Goodman and uh, Trisha O'Reilly Martin. And then one in July, uh, Wednesday, July 12th, we'll be hearing from Jillian Bruchera and Marilyn Prop. And hi, Marilyn, I saw that you're on, on tonight. Um, if, like I said, there, this is such a deep, um, well, we could be talking for hours just on this one talk, but we're going to get to hear four more amazing um, artists. If you're in uh, or around Atlanta, come by the museum. We're open nine to five, Monday through Fridays. It's free, it's open to the public. And then um, we will be having an in-person uh, closing reception in August, Friday, August 4th. Um, so I hope that you guys will come by and um, see the show in person. Also, if you'd like to help uh, support um, more programming like this, um, we're always happy to take donations. MyGeorgiaTech.gatech.edu backslash giving backslash um, paper making. And we can also be found um, on uh, social media. Uh, our website is paper.gatech.edu. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Pinterest. If you'd like to join our newsletter, uh, shoot an email to our education curator, Anna Dahl, anna.dahl at rbi.gatech.edu. The uh, Illuminated Feminist Seed Bank and the um, Pulp Under Pressure catalog are available for purchase online. Um, we, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's, if it's up, if the link is up already on our website, but we will definitely get it up if it's not. Um, otherwise, the uh, link uh, that was shared in, in the chat to Rennie's website will get you to um, the Pulp Under Pressure uh, catalog. And is the Feminist Seed Bank book, can, can people find the link to purchase that book on one of your websites, Melissa or Maggie? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, and we did provide their um their websites and um, Instagram in the chat. Uh, and I think that's it. Thank you all so much for uh, such an amazing talk and, and just out in the world doing um, 
uh, work that's much needed. Uh, just, um, you know, building community, shining light on um, uh, the need for um, maintaining the cultural history, um, creating the meditative spaces. Rennie, really, you know, we need that so much. Um, thank you all so, so much. I hope to see you back on um, June 14th, same time. Thank you, Jerusha. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Conversation.